Okay, uh, we're going to uh, continue on here uh, till chapter 10, I think. We had the last little bit we started talking about last time. Um, so we're going to finish it up, and then we'll get into organicness. All right, not my favorite part, but we'll get into organicness and stuff. Uh, chapter 10, uh, we're talking about acid and bases. Really, last time we finished up uh, kind of talking about buffers at the end there. And a reminder about buffers. A buffer, again, is a solution that can uh, maintain its pH even when you add additional acid or base to it. So as we talked about last time, remember that a buffer does not necessarily mean that it is a neutral solution uh, because you really can have a buffer at any pH that you want. It just means really whatever pH that solution is sort of starting at, uh, it should be able to kind of maintain that pH uh, is when you add more acid or base to it. Again, as long as we talked about that you uh, sort of uh, add the appropriate concentration of acid or base and your buffer is made correctly, if it's functioning correctly, it should be able to really resist large changes in pH is really the truth there. It will change pH when you add acid or base to it, but it'll be very small changes in one direction or the other but it will be able to avoid really large jumps in the pH. And really the, the way that a buffer is really able to do that is really uh, what it is made out of. And you can make a buffer out of one of two combinations, a weak acid and the salt of this conjugate base. Or you could also make a buffer out of a weak base and the salt of his conjugate acid. You cannot though, again, have a buffer that is made up of a strong acid or a strong base. And really it is because of these guys here that either the weak acid or the weak base that you choose to make your buffer out of, because they are a weak acid or a weak base, they're basically a weak electrolyte as we've talked about. So for example, the classic acetic acid and sodium acetate buffer, which is like everybody's favorite example. Uh, and so that's acetic acid and sodium acetate. And again, this is a weak acid and this is really the salt of his conjugate base. And what really, again, as we talked about last time, makes it a salt is it pretty much has a sodium because when you have sodium, uh, acetate in solution, it actually is a strong electrolyte and will break apart into these two ions. And really the functioning part of the buffer from that is actually just the acetate part. The sodium is just kind of hanging out, not really doing much in terms of the buffer or anything like that. And that's really, you know, the two parts here that make up your buffer. And a reminder that really you can think of, uh, you know, it could something be a buffer by just using the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and conjugate base. And that's just one H plus difference, which here, obviously, there's just one H plus difference uh, between those two things. So if you have a question asked, you know, can these things be a buffer? That's really the first thing you should look at is, is the only difference really one H plus? Now that is regardless though, you know, it could have a sodium like it does here, could have a potassium or something like that. But the two core things that make up the buffer the only difference really should be one H plus difference between them. And that's what we have here basically is one H plus difference. Once again, the sodium is still there, but not really important in terms of the buffer. And that's really the two sort of functioning parts of the buffer. And that means that when you would make this, you would actually pour a little bit of both of these things in here to do it. And out of the two, pretty much it's gonna be that acetic acid that's gonna set up that equilibrium in the beaker. And it's going to basically make something like this. And essentially, because you also add a little bit of sodium acetate, you kind of beef up uh, the acetate part of that equilibrium as well. And you will have in the actual buffer solution, as we talked about last time, an acid part of that buffer. And this right here, which is the conjugate base, would be the base part of the buffer. And that is essential to the function of a buffer, as we talked about last time. 
Both of those things has to be in the solution to begin with. That's because when you add additional acid, like H plus into here, the H plus will react with the base part of the buffer and basically make the acetic acid in this example. Uh, and it will do uh, some other stuff as well. When you add base to this buffer, which is OH minus, it will actually uh, react with the acid part of the buffer and basically make water and also the sodium acetate. So as we talked about last time, you know, when you have like your buffer and you have your acid part and your base part, when you add more acid, it will use up some of the base part, but you also always make some of the other part of the buffer. And same thing here, when you add some base to it, it will use up some of the acid part, but you'll make more of the base part of the buffer. And this is why a properly made buffer can sort of function over a long period of time, even if you add some acid and base, because you're kind of regenerating part of the buffer as you use the other part of the buffer up. So as long as you don't go, like we talked about at the end last time, crazy and just you know add the wrong amount of acid, or keep adding acid, you'll just eat up again, eventually the base part, and it won't be able to maintain the pH. But ultimately the way that it's able to do that is because these things are weak acid or weak bases. The reason again, you cannot have it as a strong acid or strong base as your buffer is a strong acid, strong base is a strong electrolyte and it's gonna 100% break apart, which means there's no way to keep in the buffer solution the acid part and the base part. For example, if you put hydrochloric acid and sodium chloride, like we talked about last time, all you would have in that beaker basically is chloride. You would have none of the acid part in there. So it would not be able to function as a buffer. So it's why these things have to be weak acids or weak bases uh, to be a buffer. <clears throat> Any questions on any of that buffer stuff there? No. Okay. So uh, we then got into at the end, and we'll just kind of repick back up with this here. The last thing that we're going to talk about, which is uh, Le Chatelier's principle, uh, and that involves a, a certain type of reaction, as we talked about, which is, again, an equilibrium reaction, and it's a reversible reaction. I'll learn the alphabet in a second. Hold on. Let me try that again. So like C should go with C there. That seems to be a little better. Let's see. C and D and D. And this reversible reaction will typically have the arrows heading in both directions. And as we talked about, there's sort of a forward direction which goes from reactants to products. And there's the reverse direction uh, that goes from products back to reactants. So it's really like a two-way street in this type of reaction. And that's different when you see an equation or a reaction where the arrow is basically just heading in one direction. In those type of reactions, everybody's just going to the product side. Nobody's coming back the other way. So here is kind of like a two-way street where we have the reaction sort of happening in both directions. At the very beginning, in most cases, you'll probably have mainly just the forward reaction happening because you probably have no products. But at some point, you will make enough products that they will start to combine and come back the other way. And you'll eventually get the reaction happening in both directions. And it will continue that way until it reaches chemical equilibrium. And when we have something that reaches chemical equilibrium, uh, what that means in this case is the rate of the forward direction will equal the rate of the reverse direction. So as we talked about last time, it doesn't necessarily mean kind of like the name might imply equal. It doesn't mean that you have equal amounts of everybody on both sides of the arrow. It just means when it does reach that chemical equilibrium, whatever everybody's concentration was at that particular moment, uh, they pretty much will maintain it and they won't change their concentrations. And that's because just as quick as it makes some products, it's just going to come right on back. So whatever you lose there, it comes right back. So everybody just maintains where they're at at that point when it reaches chemical equilibrium. And it will continue to do that as long as you don't do anything to screw it up, which is basically Le Chatelier's principle we'll talk about and finish talking about here in just a second. Um, remember that when you look at a, say, a beaker or something like that, or a system that has reached equilibrium, it may appear to you when you look at it that there's nothing going on. 
uh, you know, maybe it turned red and it's just done. It's just sitting there in an orangey color. Uh, and it does like maybe everything's done, nothing's happening. But actually in a reversible reaction, there's a lot of activity to, for example, keep that like orangey color that you see in the beaker. So again, if you're able to kind of super zoom in, you see a lot of reactants going to products, products going back to reactants, back and forth happening a lot. Just in the sort of the big picture, when you look at it, say in a beaker, it just looks like it's just like an orange solution. There's not much happening here anymore in the beaker. So um, that's also sort of a, a thing that sometimes confuses people when they think about equilibrium reactions. Uh, they think like, it just looks like it's done. There's nothing happening. So they sometimes say that, you know, there's a lot of frantic activity happening in equilibrium reaction. Uh, although sometimes when you look at it, it looks static, like nothing's happening on the big picture. There is a relationship uh, in these type of reactions, which is known as the equilibrium constant, and that's capital K. And basically this relationship is where we take our products, the concentration of our products divided by basically the concentration of our reactants. And that's what the little brackets means, concentration. And typically that means molarity uh, when we see these brackets. And that's usually our molarity, which is our moles per liter. And more specifically, if you were to write the equilibrium expression for a particular reaction, you would take the product concentration and you would take the coefficient in the balanced equation as the exponent times the other product here. And again, the coefficient as the exponent divided by the reactants and their exponents from the coefficients. And this will give you an equilibrium uh, concentration, our equilibrium, con equilibrium value there. Now, in order to put values into here, they do have to be equilibrium concentrations. Yeah. So they have to be what you have when sort of the reaction reaches equilibrium. They cannot be initial concentrations. So just say, for example, we had at equilibrium, concentration of A was two molar, concentration of B was uh, three molar, and our C was one molar, and our D was, we'll go with two molar as well. And let's say we actually had this as our sort of equation, 2A plus B goes to 3C plus D. So if we wanted to calculate the equilibrium constant value, we could write our expression, which would be our products, which in this case would be C, and we would cube it because of the coefficient there. Uh, we would times it by D. The coefficient here is one, so we don't have to do anything really to it. We will divide it by the concentration of A. And once again, the coefficient is two, so we would have to square it up on top because of the two and our B and the coefficient here is one. So we basically just take it to one. Since these are equilibrium concentrations, we could actually put them in. Let's see how bad I did here. We got one cubed, that's not too bad. Two divided by uh, two and we would need to square it and our B, which is three here. So if we put these numbers in, uh, we're gonna get basically here, 2 divided by 4 divided by 3. We're going to get an equilibrium constant of like 1.7 times 10 to the minus 1 in this particular case. We're solving a question on that calculation. So if you have to write the equilibrium expression, uh, you do take the coefficients of the balanced equation as the exponents, and it's always products over reactants. We also talked about basically the two things that go into this and the two things that don't go into it. So when you write a K value, and by the way, sometimes this is referred to as the KC value because it's dealing with concentrations. You could also, if these were gases, do it with pressures and atmospheres and put them in as well. That would be sometimes referred to as the KP value for pressure because you use pressures instead of concentrations. So uh, these are really the same idea, but, um, when we uh, will go into here, the two things that are included are not included, I guess. So when we go to K, we do not include 
anything that is a solid or a liquid. So if you're looking at the equation and something's labeled a solid or a liquid, you don't include it into the equilibrium expression. That leaves us really two things that are included, and those are pretty much your aqueous guys and anything that is a gas. So gases and aqueous things are included. And for the short explanation, again, as to sort of why that is, uh, aqueous things are floating around the solution, so they're going to be pretty active and be able to participate. Uh, gases have a lot of energy and are flying around, which means they also are going to be pretty active and able to participate. Solids, frankly, are like a solid, right? If you put like a rock into a glass of water, it's just going to float to the bottom and really not do much, right? It's just going to kind of sit there. Same idea. It's not going to really kind of participate in the equilibrium. And liquids, pure liquids like water, for example, uh, their concentration are so high that it really doesn't change, even if they do participate a little bit. So they're relatively constant. So only things that are aqueous, only things that are gases should go into the equilibrium expression. And we take our products over reactants. Once again, here, we talked about the value of K and what it means. If K is a large value, uh, that means that we would mainly have products when you reach equilibrium. If K is a small value, you would mainly have reactants when you reach equilibrium. So remember that the large value that we consider is anything one and above is considered large. Anything less than one is considered small. So the one we just calculated here, would that be considered large or small? would be considered small, which means we can make an assumption that when this thing reaches equilibrium, we actually would probably have slightly more reactants than products in this particular case. Question on any of that there. <clears throat> yes. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, any equilibrium constant K, uh, there's technically no units because uh, frankly, they don't really cancel out correctly in a lot of situations. So uh, K is one of the few things in chemistry that typically does not have units associated with it. It's just a number. Yeah. Other questions? Do you want it, uh, in the scientific notation? Uh, you don't have to put a scientific notation. You can if you want to, but you don't necessarily have to. Yeah. Oh, how would I type that into my calculator? Um, I would, you would do uh, probably, um, in this case, this is one, it's really not going to change, but uh, you would do something like maybe uh, one, and then uh, you'd probably either have a caret button on your calculator, or you might have like an X and a, like a little button like that. And uh, then you would hit three and it probably would pop up something like one carat three. And I'd probably hit equals at that point and then multiply it by the next number. Was it three, maybe? Uh, whatever the next number was and hit equals. And then you would do the kind of the same thing on the bottom, divide by the first one. And, uh, you know, if that first one was also squared or something, I forget the number. But if you had a two, um, I would again hit kind of the carrot and to two and I would probably hit equals after that first one put some parentheses around it and stuff like that now some calculators do have some people's calculators have like a square button that you could use and some people's calculators might even have like a cube button in, in that situation uh, so it just kind of depends on your calculator there's a lot more variations on those type of things other questions yeah when, uh, Yeah, so usually the standard unit that you use in any type of equilibrium calculation is usually atmospheres is the one that you typically use. You would probably want to convert them to atmospheres and then put it into the expression. Yeah. Other questions? Sorry. Yeah. So we're just, that's 
That, that would be your answer for the value of the equilibrium constant that what we were just calculating this made up sort of thing. And basically what that would, basically a lot of times what, uh, there's a lot more calculations with it that we're obviously not gonna do in this class, but uh, one of the things that you could use when you know, for example, the equilibrium constant value is uh, you can make a prediction of like when this reaches equilibrium, what you would mainly think would be there. And in this case, basically what that number tells us is when we do reach equilibrium, we're going to probably have a lot more of those reactants than products. We'll still have products, uh, but in terms of the ratio of those two, uh, we'll have more reactants than products. Just like if you had a large value of K when it reaches equilibrium, it would mean that you have a lot more products than you have reactants. And there's definitely a wide varied degrees of large and small. There are large values, for example, of K values uh, that are like times 10 to the 54. And that's like a giant number, which means even though it is technically a reversible reaction, it's pretty much all going towards the product side because it's a really, really large uh, value. But even with something that big, it's because it's a reversible reaction, a little bit of it will still come back the other way. So you'll still have a little bit of your reactants. And on the other side as well, there are actually some uh, KSP, which are equilibrium concentration, equilibrium uh, values as well. And they have something like to the minus like 36 or something like that. And that's an incredibly small value, which means pretty much everybody's staying on the reactant side. There's very little going to the product side and stuff like that. So if you think about like, for example, silver chloride, right, which is insoluble. Um, it has a KSP value, which is an equilibrium constant value for silver chloride, which is like super small. Uh, like again, to the minus, I don't know, 18, 20, something like that. And what that really means is what we think about silver chloride, which is it's pretty much going to stay to the left there, which is the solid part of it. It's not going to break apart very much into the ions and stuff like that, which is why we think of it as being insoluble when those two guys come together. But even something like silver chloride, even though solubility rules tells us it's going to be a solid, a little bit of it will still break apart and go into the ions and kind of go back and forth. Other questions on that? All right, back to Le Chatelier's principle here. Um, so as we were talking about before, uh, and I think we talked about concentration, the idea here is these equilibrium uh, reactions, pretty much you will apply some type of stress to it. And we talked about concentration last time as a stress. Uh, in addition, volume and pressure. Also temperature and a catalyst. These are all stress that you could add to a system that's at equilibrium. And frankly, for a lack of a better description is when you do this, you're going to screw up the equilibrium. So it's no longer gonna be going back and forth at the same rate as uh, it did when it was at equilibrium. But because it's an equilibrium reaction, kind of the interesting thing about these type of reactions is it will self-correct itself. It will want to get itself back to equilibrium. Even if you do something to it and mess it up, it's going to want to get back to that situation where the forward reaction, the reverse reaction uh, will equal each other. So typically what happens as we talked about last time is it will either shift to the right, which means you're going to make more products. It will shift to the left, which will make more reactants. Or again, there can be a no change situation. So when we talked about concentration, uh, we talked about the idea that if you add more, it will shift away from the side you added it to. So if you add more reactants, the equilibrium will shift to the right, away from reactants to the product side. And if you add more products, it will shift to the left, away from the reactants uh, to the reactant side, away from the products to the reactant side. The reason for both of those things is when you have a reaction like this and you add more A, for example, what you just did is make a lot more reactants available to each other. And that's going to cause the forward direction of this reaction to occur because there's just a lot more reactants now than there are products. So they're just going to find each other a lot quicker. And that's going to cause the forward reaction to occur. If you add in more D, it will actually shift 
to the left away from the side where D is. And that again is for the same sort of reason. When you add more products, now there's more products in reactants. So they're gonna be able to find each other a lot quicker. And that's gonna cause the reverse reaction to occur. So AA is a good way to remember that, add away, yes. And whichever side of the equation you add it to, it will go in the opposite direction. When we remove, it will always shift towards the side we removed it from. So same idea here, if we had this reaction and we decided to get rid of some A, when we remove some A, there's two ways you could think about it. Uh, you could think about it as like you made a big hole on the left-hand side there. So you gotta go fill the hole uh, and it's going to go towards the side that we removed it from. Um, what's really happening here is you actually remove some reactants, which once again means you now actually have more products. So they're gonna come together and go in the reverse direction. And that's why it goes towards the side you removed it from. Same thing here, if I remove C, that's going to create like a hole over there on the product side, and it's going to shift towards the product side, towards the side you removed it from. So sometimes people like to think of it as like, oh, I just created a hole. I got to go fill the hole. So that's the way it's going to go. Or again, the real reason, again, here is the same idea. You remove some products, you have a lot more reactants. So the forward direction of reactants going to products is basically what's going to happen in this case. Any questions on concentration? Like I think we did some professionally drawn stick figures last time. Yes, I believe. All right, then we're gonna talk about the next sort of stress uh, to a system, which is volume and pressure. And volume and pressure is typically sort of uh, used together or thought of together. So volume and pressure. And we do know this relationship. We talked about it with gas laws. That's our friend Boyle, right? So what happens when my volume goes up? pressure goes down, right? Opposite relationship. So in a situation where you increase the volume or you decrease the pressure, what will happen is it will shift to the side with the most gas molecules present. Now that obviously is dependent on the equation you're looking at as to, is it the left-hand side that has more gas molecules? Is it the right-hand side that has more gas molecules? You should not overcomplicate deciding how many gas molecules each one has. You frankly just add the coefficient for everybody that has a G yeah, and then add up how many you have on both sides. And whichever side is more or less is uh, that particular side. If you uh, lower the volume, the pressure will go up. So we're going to shift to the side with the least number of gas molecules. I personally think about this usually in terms of the volume. And it's a really easy way to remember it, which is if I have a big volume, I need more gas molecules. If I have a really small volume, I need less gas molecules. So if you think about it in terms of the volume, that's basically which side you need to go to. Large volume or a big volume, large, more gas molecules, small volume or volume decreases, less gas molecules. And hopefully from Boyle's law, you remember the relationship of how pressure ties into that. Any questions on that there? So for example, let's say we have this, uh, reaction here and let's say these are all gas molecules and let's say that we did each of these things and we want to know will it shift to the right to the left or no change if i do these following things i add some c i remove b I decrease the pressure. I decrease the volume. I uh, add A or A. 
All right, so take a moment for each of these. Which way should the... So uh, here we go. We're going to take a look at it here. We're going to add C. Uh, C is over here on our product side. So when we add, it goes away. So we're basically adding more products. So it should shift away from it. So it should shift to the left in this case. And again, really the reason here is we now have a lot more products. So that's going to cause the reverse direction uh, to basically occur in this case. Uh, we're going to remove B. So B is over here on the reactant side. So again, you can think of it as like creating a hole over there on the reactant side. And we're going to go towards that side to fill the hole. And again, the same reason is really is what was an A there. Um, we have now more products than reactants because we got rid of some reactants. So it's going to cause that reverse direction to basically occur. If I decrease the pressure, what happens to my volume? Volume goes up, which means I now have a larger volume, which means larger volume, I need more gas molecules in this case, right? So it does depend on the equation. We want to just look at everybody that has a G and the coefficient. So that's a one and a two, which means there's three gas molecules basically on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, that's a G and that is a five. So there are five gas molecules. So in this case, it should shift which way? Should shift to the right, right? To the, or towards the more gas molecules in this case. Now I decrease the volume. That means I have a much smaller volume. So in this case, I actually need to go, yeah, it's gonna go to the left, which is the least number of gas molecules. And if I add more A here, it's going to, gonna go away from A. A is over here, it's gonna cause it to go in that direction, yeah. Any questions on that there? I'm like, wait, nothing's coming up. I should probably write what's coming up next. All right, the next uh, sort of uh, effect on equilibrium is temperature. And temperature actually works the same as concentration. And what that means is if you increase the temperature, it should shift away. And if you decrease the uh, temperature, you should shift towards it. So it works exactly the same as concentration, but the important part of this is actually knowing what type of reaction you're dealing with. And what I mean by that is, if you remember, we talked about exothermic reactions. Exothermic reactions is when heat and energy is released. And that means that when we look at an equation, we think of heat and energy as a product. So if it's an exothermic reaction, we think of energy as being like a product. And by the way, in a lot of cases, uh, it may actually write a value there on the product side. So that tells you it's exothermic. It may actually give you a value like uh, five kilocalories or five joules or kilojoules. Probably a lot of times energy and equations in chemistry are given to you with a delta H value. And that is what is referred to as the change in enthalpy. That's a fancy way of saying the heat or energy that's released in a reaction. And if you see a delta H value given to you, and frankly, the number doesn't matter, it's actually the sign that matters. And it's a negative value for energy. It typically means that that reaction is exothermic. So very often equations are given to you and at the end of it, it'll just go, hey, the delta H is negative 300 kilojoules. And again, the negative part of that number is the important thing. It tells you that it's exothermic. You should treat temperature and heat and energy as a product. Opposite of that is an endothermic reaction. And that is where heat and energy is absorbed. And in that case, we actually think of heat and energy as a reactant rather than a product. So it's a reactant. So what that means is if you have a exothermic reaction, the top one there, and you increase the temperature, it should shift away from the product side and go to the left. And if you decrease the temperature by throwing everybody on ice, 
it will be like removing products and it should go to the product side. For the bottom one, which is an endothermic reaction, if you increase the temperature, it'll be like adding more reactants. So it'll shift away from the reactant side and go to the product side to the right. And if you remove temperature or lower temperature, it'll be like removing reactants, which means it will actually shift to the left in this case. So temperature works the same as concentration. The important part is to figure out, is it exothermic or endothermic? And usually, obviously, they'll give you some type of piece of information that helps you kind of determine uh, that aspect of it. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Uh, if you have an exothermic reaction and, and you remove the heat, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, if you remove the heat, it would be, since it's exothermic, uh, the heat and energy would be thought of as a product. So it would be like removing a product. So it would be making like a hole on the product side. So it actually will shift towards the product side. So it works just like concentration. Uh, so you just got to determine which side is like the heat on, is on the left or the right. And then if you increase, it goes away. And if you decrease, it'll go towards that side. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> the last thing uh, that in terms of this is a catalyst and a catalyst is uh, again, not a reactant. It is uh, not a product and it does not get used up in the reaction. It's like that stuff you dumped in when you did that gas experiment, like the MnO2, that was like the catalyst there. And basically a catalyst will uh, speed up a chemical reaction. Usually. But in terms of uh, shifting equilibrium, it actually will be one of the things where you will get no change. So it actually won't cause any type of change in terms of shifting one way or the other. Uh, you'll just get to equilibrium a lot quicker, uh, but it will not really cause it to go one way or the other. A couple other places or ways that you could actually get a no change. Uh, you could also, for example, add like a noble gas. Noble gases are chemically inert. They're not going to react with anything. So it's just going to kind of float around and not really cause it. Another way that you could actually get a uh, no change is like if we were doing something like this, just to make it simple. Yeah. Let's say I increase the volume in this case, which way is it gonna shift? Yeah, yeah. ideally we want more gas molecules, right? But in this case on the left-hand side, we have two. And on the right-hand side, we have two, it's a tie. So nothing's gonna happen in that case. So that's another way you're gonna get kind of a no change. So there are a few things that, you know, even though you did something will overall cause kind of nothing to happen. And those are probably the three common ways, add a catalyst, a tie in terms of gas molecules on each side. And uh, if you're doing something with volume and pressure and uh, adding a noble gas, any questions on that there? All right, so let's try one more here to just to make it up. We'll go with our classic A's here. Actually, no, we'll use real things. Why not? I'm pretty sure I can think of a real reaction. Let's try one. Like almost like I'm a chemistry person here. Let's try that. Let's do this uh, plus that goes over here to this guy here. And these are all gases. I know I'm going to balance it like a real chemistry type deal. All right. I think I got it. All right, and we're going to go with this is, uh, we'll just make it up and we'll pick, uh, we'll pick endothermic. Why not? There's an endothermic reaction. Delta H is positive in this case. All right, we want to know, will it go to the left? Uh, will it go to the right? Or will there be no change? If we do the following, we're going to add some more N2, we're going to increase the pressure, we're going to decrease the temperature, we're going to add NH3, we're going to remove H2, uh, we're going to increase the temperature, why not, we'll do the opposite. And um, we will increase the volume. All right. And why not? Let's just add the classic catalyst there for the last one there. 
All right, we'll go left, right, or no change in each of these situations. Okay, let's uh, take a look and see. So we're gonna start with the adding the N2. Uh, so I can see from the equation here, the N2 there is on the left. So that means we're adding more reactants, which should cause it to shift add away from it. So it should shift to the right again. It's really gonna cause that forward reaction to occur and make more products. If I increase the uh, pressure there, that means in terms of my volume, it should have went down, right? And now I could just think about it in terms of volume. So that's a small volume needs less gas molecules in this case. So if we add up our gas molecules here, uh, we got one here and we got three here. Again, just really the coefficients and that's gonna give us four. And on this side, we have two. So in this case, it will actually shift right towards the right-hand side here, which has the least number of gas molecules in that particular case. The idea there is the change that's actually occurring is the pressure is going up and we kind of want to bring it back down. So the only way to bring it back down in a smaller volume is less gas molecules, less collisions will kind of bring the pressure back down uh, from the change. We're going to lower the temperature. So that is where this comes into play. This is endothermic, which means that heat and energy is being absorbed. More importantly, again, that's a positive value and heat is considered in this case a reactant. And that means that when we lower the temperature, that is essentially like removing a reactant, which means it should create a hole over there and we're gonna actually go towards it. Yep, towards the side where we removed it from. Question on that one there. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're gonna add some more uh, NH3, uh, which is a product. So that again, is gonna ultimately go away from the side we added it to. And that is really because we have more products now that's gonna cause the reverse reaction to occur and for it to go to the left. We're going to remove H2, which will kind of create a hole over there on the reactant side. So we're gonna go fill it uh, by going towards it. Here, we're going to increase the temperature. So that would be like adding reactants, causing more reactants to react and cause it to go away from that side and cause our products. Lastly here, our second to last, we have an increase in volume, which means we need more gas molecules, uh, which in this case is actually to the left. And adding a catalyst will cause no change to occur. Any questions on Le Chatelier's principle or how to decide it? All right, that officially ends chapter 10, yes. That means I've stalled it for as long as I can. I guess it's organic time at this point. All right, we are going to, you know, I've stalled for as long as I can. We are going to go into organic now, which means we could just put our calculators to the side there. We don't need it too much here. Not too far, you will need it obviously for the exam and stuff, but uh, you will not need the calculator throughout the rest of the chapters of the season here. So um, it shouldn't be a calculation to be found in any of these chapters. So that's, I guess, good, I suppose. All right, so we are gonna transition here to a little bit more of uh, memorization and that type of stuff, which I guess is good or not. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, we're going to talk about organic chemistry and we're going to talk about really all the different organic molecules. Uh, and we're going to start with chapter 11, which is a little introduction to organic chemistry and also some of the basic uh, foundational groups in organic chemistry. So organic chemistry, pretty much this is uh, the first sentence you can find in any organic book, which is it is the study of carbon and carbon containing uh, compounds. Pretty much most organic uh, compounds have this sort of setup. It is a bunch of uh, carbons attached to carbons and usually attached to those carbons are hydrogens. So this is kind of the general setup of most organic compounds uh, will follow this sort of pattern. As we will talk about as we go through the different sort of organic chapters, Along the way, we may get rid of some of these hydrogens and maybe substitute in some other elements, and that will give us some different types of organic compounds. Now, organic compounds, um, because they typically will have this base of carbon-carbon bond, as we know from 
bonding chapter, that is going to be a nonpolar bond, right? As they have basically the same electronegativity value. And also, if you remember, the carbon hydrogen bond is also a difference in electronegativity of uh, 0.4, which is also a nonpolar bond. Now, a lot of organic compounds are, as you might imagine, nonpolar molecules. And that's what we sort of see here, for example, oil, which is pretty much carbons and hydrogens, are nonpolar. Water is polar, which uh, means that they are not going to be able to interact really well with one another because water wants to use hydrogen bonding as its way of interacting. Uh, pretty much the oil wants to use dispersion forces. And those are very, very different ways of interacting with one another. And usually what will happen is to just kind of separate out from each other because they can't, they don't have a way to keep that interaction going. So a lot of organic compounds, which are nonpolar, uh, do not work really well with water. Now, on the other hand, as we will see in these chapters as well, when we replace some of these hydrogens, for example, uh, with other elements, like say this guy here. Now, although this compound is mainly nonpolar, it will have, for example, a polar group on it, which would make this guy here, which is methanol, actually very soluble in water because it's able to interact with water the same way water interacts with itself through hydrogen bonding. So not all organic compounds are gonna be nonpolar. Uh, a lot of them are kind of have two parts to their compounds. There's like a part of the compound that's nonpolar. And in certain cases, there could be some parts that are polar, which allows those guys to have different sort of properties uh, than uh, organic compounds that don't have those polar parts uh, in terms of solubility, in terms of things like boiling points and melting points and, and things of that nature. So uh, when we sort of swap out, as we'll talk about as we go through these different chapters, when we swap out, you know, some of these hydrogens, for example, for other elements uh, in there, there's there usually a certain part of an organic molecule that makes it a specific type of compound. And that is what is sometimes referred to as the functional group. And the functional group is pretty much the part of the organic molecule that makes that organic guy a member of a certain type of organic compound. So what I mean by that is when we look at this guy right here, the presence of an OH group uh, means that that guy is part of an organic molecules, which are known as alcohols because it has that OH group a part of it. There could be something that maybe has a double bond in it, like a double bonded carbon having that double bond being present, that carbon-carbon double bond makes it part of an organic group that's known as alkenes. So there are certain parts of organic compounds which are frankly what are known as the functional groups. And much like the name implies, that's pretty much where everything happens. So one of the things as we go through these chapters that sometimes people get in trouble with is the idea of they want to start like making weird things happen. Everything falls apart, starts making these weird shapes and stuff like that. So when we talk about reactions and we talk about things happening with organic compounds, there's really only a specific part of the molecule where anything does actually happen. And that specific part is pretty much at the functional group is where everything sort of occurs in reactions with organic compounds as we'll talk about. Um, so, an organic compound is a compound made up, as is mentioned, of those carbons and hydrogen atoms. Along the way, we will substitute other nonmetals like oxygen, uh, sulfur, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and the halogens, which is group seven on the periodic table, like chlorine, bromine, uh, fluorine, and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of organic guys are uh, nonpolar. Uh, they're found in things like gasoline, medicine, shampoos, plastics, and perfumes. That's how you get like octane, which is like the gas that you put in your car, right? And it actually comes from a really long chain of carbons. They have these really, really long chain of carbons. And what they do is what is sometimes referred to as thermal cracking. 
which is pretty much what it sounds like. They break it apart into smaller chains of carbons and you get things like, you know, uh, propane, octane, you know, different types of organic compounds from these really long chains of uh, carbon based compounds. Now, because they are pretty much nonpolar and they're pretty much uh, non-metal, non-metal pretty much happening here with organic compounds, uh, they do have covalent bonds. So these are the guys that are gonna be sharing electrons. They typically will have very low melting points and boiling points. And that is because, for example, when you take an organic guy, say like methane, It is a nonpolar molecule. And it uses, uh, as I mentioned, dispersion forces. And dispersion forces are intermolecular forces. They are the force that holds one nonpolar molecule together with another nonpolar molecule. And it's probably the weakest type of intermolecular force uh, that you can have because it relies upon something happening because a nonpolar molecule, as you might remember, is a molecule that has equal sharing of electrons. So there is no like positive side right to the molecule or negative side to the molecule. It's pretty much neutral because the electrons are being shared equally. That's different than in a polar molecule like water, right? Water is a polar molecule, which has a dipole moment and the oxygen side is always more negative than the hydrogen side because of the unequal sharing of electrons like we talked about in the bonding chapter. So when you get two nonpolar molecules together, they have to rely upon electrons kind of moving one way or the other. And they have to rely upon this guy I see on the left here, temporarily gaining a separation of charge as its electrons move one way or the other. And that will cause a temporarily a uh, charged molecule to happen to the guy on the right. And now they have a way to interact with one another through the positive and negative side of the molecule. And that's ultimately how molecules interact with each other. They interact through positive and negative interactions. So the positive side of one molecule is attracted to the negative side of another. That for example, is how like two water molecules, again, interact with each other. Oxygen more negative, hydrogen more positive and you get another water molecule, more negative, more positive. The positive hydrogen in one will be attracted to the negative oxygen in the other. And that is what is known as hydrogen bonding. And that is a very strong, probably one of the strongest intermolecular forces that you could have. So something like water has a very high boiling point because it has the ability to hydrogen bond. When you put two nonpolar molecules together, because this is a super weak type of force, it doesn't take a lot for those guys just to kind of separate off from each other and break apart. And it relies upon kind of, we make some bonds, break some bonds, make some bonds, and they kind of break and make these bonds over and over again. It's not a fixed charge like you have in something like water where uh, no matter what you do to water, water is always gonna have a negative side and a positive side. It's ready to go. It's ready to interact with something else that has a positive and negative charge. Something that's nonpolar needs something to happen for it to temporarily gain those charges so that they can interact with each other. That's why a lot of organic molecules or compounds are what is said to be volatile. They could go into the gas phase really easily, which is why a lot of times when you work with them, you do that in a fume hood because they could go open the bottle and it's liquid. It could go into the gas phase really easily. You just look at it wrong and it will do so. And the problem with a lot of organic things is, in addition, you don't really want to smell it. Uh, they're also very flammable. So if you have open flame near it, that's not good either. Uh, it could catch on fire and stuff like that. So they're very flammable and can go through combustion reactions as well. So typically, organic compounds will have these low melting points and boiling points because they're held together by very weak interactions. As I talked about earlier, you know, as we change out some of these hydrogens and we put on other compounds or other parts of it, like that OH group and that alcohol group, when you have two of these methanols together, because they have that group, they're going to be able to interact really well with each other 
and actually something like methanol, though it's still an organic compound, will actually have a higher boiling point than say something like methane because methanol has the ability to hydrogen bond, which is a really strong interaction. And you would see that the boiling point for something like that will be much higher than the boiling point for something like methane that has no ability to hydrogen bond. A reminder that in order to hydrogen bond, you need more than just a hydrogen. You need a hydrogen that is directly bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So only hydrogens that are directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine has the ability to hydrogen bond. So if you're thinking, well, doesn't this guy have a bunch of hydrogens? He does, but none of them can participate in hydrogen bonding uh, because they're not directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. And again, that's what gives it a lower melting point and boiling point. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> By the way, the boiling point and melting point does increase with molar mass. So if you had two nonpolar molecules and you wanted to compare the boiling point or melting points to them, the one that has the greater molar mass would actually be the stronger or higher boiling point and melting point because it has a lot more atoms and a lot more electrons. And there's a greater opportunity for those electrons to move around and allow it to kind of participate in dispersion forces. Any questions on that there? Yeah. They are. So uh, or organic compounds in general are not soluble in water. There are certain ones like alcohols that are soluble in water. And as we'll talk about, even though, for example, this guy right here, would definitely be soluble in water. But what happens, for example, is if we had something similar with an OH group, but you attached, there's a ton of carbons on it. And all of hydrogens, I won't draw all the hydrogens, but all these carbons have hydrogens all the way across. Something like that is not soluble at all. So it's because of that nonpolar part of the molecule is too large for it to interact well with water. So there are certain organic molecules that are small, have these polar groups. And because they're small and they have these polar groups, they're able to interact well with water and be soluble in water and have higher boiling points. But the typical general trend with organic molecules is as soon as you hit like five or more carbons, things like solubility, things like... Uh, being soluble in water drops to like almost nothing. And it's just because that part of the molecule is just so big and it's nonpolar, it doesn't fit really well at all with water. So small things, usually like in a lot of cases, five or less carbons will be fairly soluble in, wa in water if it has like an OH group or something on it. Uh, but as you build out that kind of carbon part of it, it gets, as it loses the solubility and stuff like that. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So, uh, uh, many inorganic compounds, which is everything outside of organic chemistry, things like ionic compounds, uh, they typically have very high melting points and boiling points. And that is because ionic compounds are pretty much held together by the strongest interaction you could have, which is your cation, your positively charged, and your anion, which is your negatively charged. And that is your electrostatic attraction. That's actually an intramolecular force and it's really super strong. So uh, they typically have high melting points and boiling points. I think we might've talked about it as well. Uh, typically you could heat the heck out of something that's uh, an ionic compound and it will not go into the gas phase, which means it's gonna hold together and it will start to melt before it'll actually start to boil and stuff like that. So something like salt has a uh, very high melting point and boiling point. Something like propane has a low one. And if you think about, you might be familiar with a lot of uh, early or small sort of organic compounds, things like methane, right? Propane, butane. You might be familiar with those things. Those things are all gases, right? That's how we all find them, basically all those things. And it's because they're held together by very weak forces and you just look at them wrong and they're just gonna go into the gas phase or stay in the gas phase or just be in the gas phase uh, to begin with. <clears throat> So here's a little table from your book that compares the differences, again, against organic versus inorganic, uh, typically nonmetals for organic, carbon, hydrogen, really the basis of that. 
uh, structure covalently bonded, ions in terms of ionic compounds, electrons being transferred, nobody's sharing electrons, typically nonpolar bonds in organic, a lot of ionic and polar bonds happening there, low boiling points, melting points, uh, high melting points and boiling points in our uh, inorganic stuff and flammability very, very high in terms of organic, again, because they can just go into that gas phase really easily and sort of catch on fire and like to do a lot of combustion reactions. So we want to identify the characteristics as either inorganic or organic, as high melting points would be inorganic, right? Yeah. Uh, is not soluble in water would be organic. Uh, has the formula like this that looks like carbons and hydrogens. So that's going to be really the basis of organic. That is an ionic compound. So that's inorganic. It burns easily in air. That's going to be organic combustion reaction. I think we talked about it right. Basically, if you take an organic compound, which has carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen, react it with oxygen, you get CO2 and water, which is the typical organic combustion reaction. It is what happens when you light a Bunsen burner. Yeah, Methane comes out, give it a spark with the oxygen in the air, you get fire, right? When you light your barbecue, if it's not a coal burning barbecue uh, and it's got a propane tank, same idea, right? You have an electrical starter, you click it, gives a spark, right? And lights the gas with the oxygen and you could cook your hamburgers, right? Or your barbecue. Covalent bonding is going to be organic as well, right? Because those are our non-metals happening here. So let's talk a little bit about hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, like the name implies, is compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen. Let us talk about our friend carbon, right? Carbon has how many valence electrons? Four? Yeah. Carbon wants to make, and you should remember this when you're doing organic, it wants to make four bonds pretty much is the goal. And as that follows our normal bonding, which I heard eight being screamed out there, which is the octet rule, if I could spell it with an O, octet rule there, right? So the same octet rule still applies in organic chemistry, right, that we talked about with bonding. And really that is one of the most important things to remember is carbon four. And I say four because it should never be more than four. It's gonna be like 20 lines of carbon, although I've seen it on a lot of exams. Don't put 20 lines of carbon. People go crazy, they start drawing things and like, I feel it's more chemistry, like if I just keep putting lines to it, and it looks much better. Also, our friend hydrogen should have how many electrons? And when it makes a bond, it should only have two, right? The duet rule, right? It only needs to get to helium to be happy, right? While we're here, let's talk about our friend hydrogen and organic drawing. Once again, that is pretty much what hydrogen should look like, should never be in the middle, always be on the outside. And you should never, ever, ever, ever do that or that or that or that or combination thereof because you'll get that and you don't want that because that's not good. Yes. So don't do any of those things. Remember, this is pretty much what hydrogen should look like. Do not double bond it. Do not triple bond it. Do not put it in the center. It will have too many electrons. Those are the biggest problems that people have when they start drawing things, which is they get really creative. Yes, and they just start drawing lines and dots everywhere. So carbon should only have something like this. This is what is known as a saturated hydrocarbon. A saturated hydrocarbon has the maximum number of hydrogens possible which means in this guy right here, I have one carbon and it wants to make four bonds and it has four hydrogens. That is the maximum number of hydrogens that it can have. It is saturated. When I look at this guy here, each of these carbons are saturated because they have the maximum number of hydrogens that they could have. How come they don't have four? because one of the bonds went to 
carbon, right? So because we have the bond to carbon, the next maximum amount that they could have on each of them is three. So they have the maximum number of hydrogen. Unsaturated hydrocarbons occur, as we will talk about, when you do like say a double bond. If I put a double bond in there, I can only have two hydrogens on each of those carbons. And that is because if I put another hydrogen, each carbon will now have 10 electrons, which is more than eight. So it can't have that. So this is what is referred to as being unsaturated. It does not have the maximum number of hydrogens as possible. Happens when you have a double bond or a triple bond. By the way, as we will see, they both have two carbons, the guy here and the guy here. When I put the double bond in, what happened to some hydrogens? I lost hydrogens where? I lost one on each side. And that always happens when you put an extra bond on carbon. You got to make room for it. So you lose two hydrogens, one on each carbon. If I were to do a triple bond, I would then have to lose another two carb hydrogens, right? And now we would have a triple bond, which is definitely unsaturated as well in this particular case. If I get out of the way, you can actually see it. Putting a triple bond here, we have to lose those hydrogens up on top. Uh, and again, we would only have one. By the way, that is what is known as an alkyne. A triple bonded carbon is a functional group in organic chemistry. There is a bunch of them. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So that is methane. And when we talk about organic compounds, there's some different types of uh, structures that we sometimes draw. Um, <clears throat> this is a space field model structure. A lot of times computers used to do that. This is what is referred to as the ball and stick model because that's what your model will look like if you build it with molecular models. This is the wedge and dash type situation where you have this guy kind of coming out of the screen, the dash one going behind the screen, try to just supposed to give like a three dimensional sort of, <laughs> I know, <laughs> he's supposed to give like a three dimensional sort of look to it. Uh, and we have really just our expanded structural formula, which is a very common formula. So this is, uh, for example, we'll look at this one that we drew. Actually, we'll look at this one. So this is three carbons. And by the way, three carbons this is our friend propane, by the way, that's propane. The, what I just drew out here is basically all the hydrogens drawn out. And this is what is sometimes referred to as the expanded structural formula. You could also draw this where you actually don't draw the hydrogens out and you kind of condense them down and you would draw something like CH3 uh, for this part. You could then draw CH2 or that part, carbon and two hydrogens. And then you could draw A CH3 over here at the back end here, CH3. This is basically where we do not draw out the hydrogens. This is what is known as the condensed formula, where you don't draw out the hydrogens. Now, just so you know, when you look at a condensed formula, the connection here is still, as you see here, carbons to carbons, even though it may look like we're connecting a hydrogen to a carbon here. Uh, we're not, so in a condensed formula, uh, it just sort of doesn't draw out the hydrogens, but you have to remember those hydrogens are not in the row. Uh, they're connected to those carbons that they're attached to. Now, when we look at something like this, there we throw back here, right? That carbon right there in this methane, has one electron pair, two electron pairs, three electron pairs, and four electron pairs, right? 
also has one, two, three, and four bonds. That geometry is tetrahedral, right? That's why it says right about there, 109.5 bond angle, if you remember from bonding. And we can also draw organic molecules very commonly with what I like to call line structure. And line structure is uh, pretty much what it sounds like. Uh, it's going to look something like that. That is uh, this guy right here. Yes. So it's basically just lines. Everywhere the line ends is a carbon. Everywhere the line comes together is a carbon. And since carbon needs four bonds, everything else is hydrogen. This carbon at the end has one line going into it, which means it should have one hydrogen, two hydrogens, and three hydrogens to get the four. The carbon in the middle has how many lines coming to it? which means how many hydrogens does it need to get the four? Two, right? So it has just two. Carbon at the end has one line coming to it to get to the magic number of four for carbon is three hydrogens, yeah? Although you never ever in line structure draw any of that, you would just draw a very badly done one like that. Maybe a better one right there. So line structure is very commonly used in organic chemistry and uh, it's really sort of like a basic structure. It doesn't get very complicated. It just kind of shows things that are important uh, in the compound. I would say those three are the three probably that you'll see the most uh, through our organic chapters. Uh, expanded structural, condensed a lot, and also line structure is used a lot along the way. Any questions on that there? The expanded structure actually has the carbons written out and the hydrogens written out. This is really what uh, line structure is, as I erased it, apparently. Um, this right here is really what line structure is. There's nothing else written. No carbons written, nothing like that. So that's just line structure. Or you you know, because when anything is drawn in a line structure, for example, like this, how many carbons would that have? Yeah, this would be a carbon, right? That would be a carbon. 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 And that would be a carbon at the end. Again, you don't really write carbons or put the little circles like I just did there. Is that seven? I think you're right there. So that is seven carbons this guy would have. So that's the basis of it. If it had any other group as well, by the way, it would be uh, written in there. Like, you know, it will show, it will actually write the other groups. So carbons and hydrogens are usually not displayed in a line structure. But if you had, say, like an OH group, for example, uh, it would be drawn with a line and the OH would be there and you'd be able to see it. And then you would know, I think hopefully answer your question, that that would be like an alcohol now. You could kind of see the alcohol group in it. So any type of special functional group that's on there is usually sort of drawn out in line structure. So you could kind of uh, see it as well. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> So obviously in this one that I just drew here, this would be a carbon, right? That would be a carbon, that would be a carbon, and that would be a carbon. And again, each of those carbons would have the appropriate number of hydrogens. This guy at the end should have three hydrogens, right? Because it has one line coming in. The carbon next to it right here should have how many hydrogens? It should only have one, right? Because it has three lines already. So it should only really have one. This carbon should have two, right? And the guy at the end should have Three. So if we wanted to turn this into a condensed formula, uh, we would have CH3, right? Here is CH2. Here is CH. And usually what people will also do in condensed when they have a special group like an OH is uh, they will actually still draw kind of it like a bond and kind of draw the OH above it. So it doesn't get all kind of confused as to what goes where. And then we would have our kind of CH3. So that's typically how you would sort of draw something that has like a, a different functional group in there. You would still sort of draw the functional group up and uh, sort of out of the way uh, again. So usually we kind of keep uh, carbons and hydrogens and that condensed thing in the middle and anything that's sort of attached will kind of go up on the end. Any questions on that there?
And by the way, because of that tetrahedral geometry, uh, sometimes people refer to this as the zigzag pattern of organic chemistry. That's why it kind of zigzags up and back. Each of those carbons are tetrahedral, so they're tetrahedraline, and it creates this kind of zigzag sort of relationship that you see uh, in especially uh, single bonded guys like we have here. That's ethane, uh, as we just talked about. And again, here's some of those formulas as we talked about and our condensed formula here and our expanded formula there. If uh, butane uh, molecules here, what is the shape around each of the carbon atoms? So the shape on this guy is how many electron pairs and bonds? It's four electron pairs, right? And four bonds, which means this guy is tetrahedral. This carbon is tetrahedral as well. This one is, and this one is, they're all tetrahedral here, right? They're all single bonded. So pretty much you got single bonded carbon to another carbon, tetrahedral, as long as you don't have any double bond or triple bond around that carbon, they're all gonna have that tetrahedral. And if we were to draw this in line structure, it would look something like this. And again, that is four carbons basically, yes. And uh, this guy right here would be this carbon. This guy right here would be this carbon. This guy right here would be this carbon. And this guy at this end would be that end. And obviously, again, not usually drawn with the circles and no hydrogens, but you gotta remember that it pretty much has the appropriate number of hydrogens to get the four. That's really important when we start drawing other things to remember that, that at some point you're gonna run out of things to draw. And you're like, what else goes there? And what it goes there usually is hydrogen. So you just think about, okay, how many more bonds does this carbon need to get the four? And that's how many hydrogens you kind of put on there. Uh, and we'll talk about how to draw these things shortly as well. So let's talk about alkanes. Alkanes are the simplest organic molecules. They are the most important because they come first. But they really are most important because pretty much, as I mentioned before, there's all these different types of organic molecules that have different functional groups, but pretty much everything that you do in terms of naming and everything like that, pretty much all come back down to these guys. So everything sort of falls back on to the alkanes and how they're named. And you do some slightly different things along the way, uh, but things come back to them all the time. So we're going to talk about the first 10 alkanes in a second. And it's really important if you want to sort of uh, progress nicely with organic, the quicker you learn the first 10 alkane names, the better off you're going to be, both the names and the formulas, because everything will pretty much go back to those first 10 names. And you'll just do some slightly different things to get the names of everything else. Alkanes have a functional group, although some people may not call it a functional group, but we will. Why not? Uh, pretty much carbon, carbon, single bond action happening there. So alkanes are all about carbon, carbon, single bonds, no double bonds, no triple bonds to be found. All the carbons are single bonded to each other. That means they all will have the tetrahedral geometry that we just talked about. They will have that zigzag shape. They have a general formula of CN H2N plus two. N is the number of carbons. So for example, if I have one carbon, one times two is two plus two is, it should have four hydrogens. And that is what is known as methane. If I have two carbons, N is two, two times two is four plus two is six. And that is what is known as ethane. As we just saw there, if I have three carbons, three times two is six plus two is eight, will give us our propane here. Perhaps you can see a pattern. This is called methane, ethane, propane, A N E at the end of them. And they're all members of alkanes a n e so the way that we name alkanes is pretty much like that we put a n e at the end of it and that's how you know you're dealing with an alkane 
any questions on that there. So alkanes are hydrocarbons with carbon-carbon single bonds, carbon, hydrogen double bonds. Now alkanes can be a couple of different ways, if you will. Uh, we can have alkanes which are pretty much straight on through, like so. This is what is sometimes referred to as a straight chain or continuous chain. We also can have organic guys that go straight for a bit, uh, but then maybe branch off some other things. And much like I just mentioned, uh, this is what is sometimes referred to as a branch chain. It has like a main chain, like a tree, right? And off the tree you stump there, right? You got all these branches, right? Coming off of it. And that's how organic molecules could be as well. They also can be cyclic, which means this end and this end decide, hey, let's just close up on each other. And they could actually close up on each other in a ring type of structure as well, which are sometimes referred to as cyclic alkanes are cycloalkanes and they make like a ring type structure to do so each of these guys would have the appropriate number of hydrogens as well so straight chain branches coming off uh, we could have kind of ring type structures uh, which are cyclic um, we name these guys typically when we go through the naming of all these different organic compounds we follow what is sometimes referred to as the IUPAC naming, which is the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. They're like the three guys that just decide how you name everything. So you could thank them, send your letters to them uh, personally for all those weird rules. And we're going to see some more weird rules and this stuff as well. Uh, but pretty much uh, our alkanes all will end in A-N-E. And that's, again, how you know it's a carbon-carbon single bond and that they are these alkanes. We do use some Greek prefixes uh, to name the carbon chains with five or more. So let's talk a little bit about uh, those names, which is here. Um, so these are the first 10 alkanes, which is what I basically said was really important. So this table, probably really important to know quick sooner rather than later. I will say on this slide, but I think it's okay in your book. Uh, these line structures are kind of off by one. So they all kind of go down by one. They're in the wrong sort of spot. I think I kind of moved a little bit. So they all kind of go down. All right. So uh, as I mentioned before, we had our one carbon, which means we have four hydrogens. That is our friend methane. Two carbons, six hydrogens. That is ethane. Three carbons, eight hydrogens, that is propane. Four carbons, 10 hydrogens, that is butane. Five carbons and 12 hydrogens. Now we're going to get into some of our prefixes. Penta for five, pentane. Six carbons, that would be 14 hydrogens. Hexa, so that's going to be hexane. Go this way. Seven carbons will give us 16 hydrogens. That is hepta for seven, heptane. Eight carbons gives us 18 hydrogens, octa for octane here. Nine carbons gives us 20 hydrogens. That is nonane. Could be making that up, but I guess I'm not. There it is. C10, H22 is decane. So again, these are really, really important to know the names, know how many carbons there are. Each of these are still following what we just talked about, CN, 
H2N plus two in terms of their formula, in terms of how many hydrogens they should have. Everything <clears throat> that we're going to talk about will basically fall back to these 10 names and uh, we'll do some little things to it. But this is really the basis of all the other chapters. All the other naming that we will do is really these guys. Any questions on that there? So we saw our condensed uh, structural formula, which again has our uh, CH3, CH2, CH2, and CH3, which is our butane. Again, really the only deal with that is we're just not gonna draw out the hydrogens and we're going to combine them. And as I mentioned before, again, our connection here is carbon to carbon in each of these basically. And there it is, our expanded and our condensed way of drawing it, as we talked about. This is, I guess your book calls the skeletal formulas. It's really line structure. And again, uh, we really don't write in the sort of carbons like they did here, but that is what each of these do represent. All right, so we talked about that. Uh, it's all that, I think. All right, so uh, the molecular formula here for this guy would be, molecular formula is just the formula, right? So we just wanna count up the parts. So this is one carbon, right? Two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons. So it has five carbons. And since this is all single bonded, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 hydrogens as that follows our CN H2N plus two. Five times two is 10 plus two more is 12 hydrogens. Yeah. Uh, our condensed formula would be that is a CH3. That is a CH2. That is another CH2. That is another CH2. And that is another CH3 at the back end there. And that is one, two, three, four, five carbons, which means the name of this guy is, it is pentane as there is nothing else attached in this case. So it would just be basically pentane. By the way, another thing that sometimes happens with condensed formulas is, for example, if you had something like this, I'm not sure how many I drew there. But we have basically one, two, three, four, five, six of those CH2 units that are just repeating. So sometimes people actually shorten it even more and do something like this. We six, right? Yeah, six and something like this. So if you see something like this, this is a shorthand of shorthand, uh, which is basically you have six of those units that repeat. So if you were to count up carbons, you want to make sure that you hit that guy six times in the middle and uh, add it up. <laughs> Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. All right. So our condensed uh, forma for ethane, which is two carbons, right? So two times two is four plus two is six. So it should have something like this. If we were to draw it out, it would look something like this. This is obviously not the condensed formula. This would be the expanded formula, right? The condensed formula would be then just to take these guys like so, right? In each of those cases, yeah. Any questions on that one there? Heptane should have how many carbons? Should have seven. And we know that two times seven is 14 plus two is 16. Yeah, I'm not gonna draw it all out that way, I don't think. So you want me to? I know, here, I'll do it for you. We aim to please here. I'm not sure, I lost track myself there. If that's three, six, seven, we'll go with it. This is the expanded, I'm fall asleep as I draw it, no, I'm just kidding. No, this is the expanded, still expanding, still going. Almost there, which is why perhaps we have the condensed formula because that's a lot of like H's to draw there. Uh, we can do our CH3, CH2, 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 CH2. I totally lost track. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, and a CH3. Yeah. 
We also could do the even more condensed formula that we did where you could put the little bracket or parentheses around it and put the little number on the bottom if you wanted to as well. Any questions on those there? All right, well, I feel like we should get into some real naming here. I think we've just, you know, moved around it the whole time here. Let's just talk about it. All right, let's talk about naming here because I got some free slides. Why not? Naming alkanes and the process that we should go about naming, which is, for example, let's say we had something like this. Why not? Let's do something like this. So let's say we want to name this, and there's a few things that we kind of need to look at when we go to name it. Pretty much the first thing that we want to do is we always want to find the longest continuous carbon chain. Now the longest continuous carbon chain does not necessarily has to be the straightest. It could go straight, it could go up, it could go over. Uh, it could start at the bottom, go up, go up and over. The only thing that you cannot do is you cannot backtrack. So you gotta go one way and go the other way until you hit a dead end and figure out how many carbons. So take a look at that, try all the different ways and try to determine what is the longest carbon chain. I'm gonna do that as well, because frankly, I was just making up whatever I was drawing here. So take a moment, try to find the longest continuous carbon chain. All right, what do we think? Five, five, I like it. Let's see. First option, let's just go straight across, right? So uh, one, two, three, four, so that's four. All right, next option would be perhaps uh, we go uh, straight across and then angle up, right? And come this way, right? So that is one, two, three, four, and five, which sounds good. There actually is some other options, but I don't think we're gonna beat five, but let's just see. By the way, you could go this way, one, two, and then up three and four, which obviously is still less than five. I'm thinking five is good. I could go this way and down to the CL. No, it's actually a CL. People always get confused. They see the C and they go carbon. That is actually chlorine, so you can't go down. Uh, so you could only go straight across. So it's very colorful right now, but I think the winner here is actually five in terms of the longest carbon chain. Again, as you can see, it doesn't necessarily have to be the straightest one. They want to go straight across. You can also, in certain situations, as we will see, have like a tie, if you will. Like you could have one that goes up and over, that's five. You could have one that goes straight, for example, that's five. I would recommend that if you do have one that happens to just go straight, pick that one as your longest one, uh, rather than the one that kind of goes all over the place. But it doesn't really matter, but sometimes we'll make it easier. All right, so we're gonna dissect naming here. I'm gonna get rid of everything that's not good. So we're keeping the green, I think, yes. So we'll re-highlight that one more time here. All right, so our longest carbon chain is starting here, going up and over right there. And when you find the longest continuous carbon chain in the case of naming, uh, it's basically going to match, for example, are alkanes because these are all single bonded, right? So five carbons is pentane. So that's going to be really the kind of base of your name is going to be pentane as five carbons is our longest continuous chain. That is what I sometimes call like the main part of the chain, right? The main thing. But if we look at it, there are a couple of things here that are attached to it that is not counted in those five carbons. 
And that would be, for example, uh, this guy right here and this guy right here. These guys that are not part, oops, I know, that's like, seriously? Uh, you know that's not going to be there, aren't I know, you know, that's not going to be there, right? Ah, uh, what the heck? I have a really sort of good memory. All right, so we had this, we had this. I feel like we want one more maybe, and then we went up. And I see H3 that way, and it was here a CL, which means I need one less hydrogen there, right? Good. Mega memory courses are paying off, I tell you. That's good. <laughs> All right. Let's try that again. Clear the computer is going. We should be done for today. All right. So we're going to re-highlight that one more time, just like so there. And obviously, that is our longest carbon chain. And uh, and as we said, that is obviously pentane in this case, uh, which is our five carbons. All right. Once again, with filling, uh, that is uh, two things that are not part of the main chain, but are still attached to it. And these are what are referred to as groups. And groups are uh, guys that are, as we can see here, not part of that longest continuous carbon chain. Groups that are carbon-based are what are referred to as alkyl groups. Now, when I look at this group right here, this is basically a CH3, right? And that looks very much like CH4, right? But it is missing one hydrogen, yes? The reason is missing one hydrogen is if I have CH4 and I wanna attach it to another carbon like that carbon right there, and I do that, is that okay? Yeah, because it's got like too many bonds. So we actually have to get rid of a hydrogen here to allow it to be a group so that when it attaches to the other carbon that's part of the main chain, you don't end up with too many bonds. But it is still based off of that one carbon guy, which is methane, right? This is an alkyl group and alkyl ends with YL. So instead of methane, this guy is what is known as a methyl YL group, yeah? And it has one carbon and it's a group that's attached to the main chain. So instead of methane, it's known as a methyl group. If I had a two carbon group attached that is based off of ethane, that would be known as a ethyl group, yeah? If I had a three carbon group, carbon guy attached as a group, that would be a propyl group, yeah? So groups that are carbon-based have one less hydrogen than its alkane counterpart, and you drop the last part of the alkane name and replace it with the YL, and it becomes basically a group. So that's really a methyl group there. This CL is not a carbon-based group, it's actually a halogen. And halogens are named like Cl is chloral, Br is bromyl, Io is iodo, F is floral. So that is how those halogens are named. So this is actually just what is named as a chloral group. And again, bromyl for bromine, iodo, iodo for iodine, bromyl for Br if you have that. Floral for fluorine, if you have that. So now I have the groups that are there and I have the long main chain that is there. What is left is actually just to uh, name it and put it together. What we do when we name something in organic chemistry is all about telling a person exactly where you could find everybody, which means we need to tell 
the person that we're naming this for where we could find each of those groups and where they are located on the longest carbon chain. That means that after you sort of locate your groups and their names, you then need to number the longest carbon chain. So when we look at the chain that I highlighted in green, we have two ways that we can number it. We could start on the left and go one, that's carbon number one, that's carbon number two, that's carbon number three, that's carbon number four, and that's carbon number five. We also have the opposite option, which is we could start numbering right to left. And this would be carbon number one. That would be carbon number two. This would still be carbon number three. That would be carbon number four. And that would be carbon number five. So these are two ways that we can basically number the longest carbon chain. Any questions on your options there? All right, so I'm just gonna get rid of some of this here. So we got some more to write. Can you, can you just do that over again? The numbering part? Yeah. I, I can. Thank you for asking. No, I'm just kidding. Let me get rid of that. Um, get that. All right. So we're just really numbering the, the carbons in the main chain, the longest continuous carbon chain. So really, you usually only have basically two ways that you could do that. You could either go kind of left to right or right to left in numbering. So if I went left to right, this would be my starting carbon, which would be carbon number one. This would be my next carbon in the row two. Next to it would be three. This would be four. And this would be five going in that direction. The opposite way that you would have the chance to number this would be starting on the right-hand side up here as this guy being carbon number one. Then to the left there would be carbon number two. This would be carbon number three. That would be carbon number four. And that would be carbon number five. So one way or the other way, basically. Yeah. Now, we're not going to actually keep both ways. There is a correct way to number and perhaps an incorrect way to number. And in the case of alkanes, it's dependent on the actual groups as to where they are located. So let's start with the uh, right to left numbering. If I went right to left, I would have a group at number three. And I would have a group at number four, right, if I went in that direction. If I went left to right, which is the blue direction here, I would have a group at carbon number two and a group at carbon number three. Yeah. Everybody see what I'm doing there? Yeah. Okay. So when you number, you always want to number the longest carbon chain to give the groups in alkanes the smallest number. And in this case, it is not overcomplicated between two and three. Which one is the smaller number? Two. So this one wins because two is less than three. So the way that we would want to number this is actually in the blue direction here because it gives the groups that are attached the smaller set of numbers. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Say again. Yeah. There is, so uh, uh, starting, going in the blue direction, we'll, we'll do it by color, going in the blue direction, right? That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, and that's five. Going in the black direction, which is our right to left direction here, uh, one to two, to three, to four, to five, yeah. So it's just a different way of numbering it, which right to left or left to right, yeah, yeah. Now, because of what we just determined, we actually would not want to number it this way. We would actually want to number it in the blue direction, which gives us the smaller numbers. Now that we have which direction we should number it, I'll get rid of all that guys here. We really have everything that we need to actually name this guy. And we name it by putting the group's name in alphabetical order first, regardless of number. 
So regardless of number, it's alphabetical based on the group. And regardless of any prefixes that might be there, there is no prefix in this case. So in this case, that means that our chlorine or chloral group is two, and this guy is three. And we do put a dash between a number and a letter. So when you're writing between a number and a letter, you put a dash. When you have two numbers together, you put a comma between the two numbers. And if you have a letter that goes into a number, you also put a dash between it. It's always a dash between numbers and letters and a comma between two numbers. I know you could, again, send your letters to the IUPAC. Thank you for all these word names. I know, right? I want my calculator back. All right, so all we have now is basically this guy, right? Uh, we got this guy and we got our base of our name. So alphabetical between M and C, which one comes first? Yeah, so this is going to be a two dash chloral dash three dash methyl. I'm going to say it one more time. I heard a what? <laughs> So that's a two dash chloral, which means on carbon number two of our longest carbon chain, I could find the chlorine hanging out, yes? Dash three methyl, which means if I go to carbon number three of that longest carbon chain, I will find my methyl group hanging out. And that longest carbon chain is pentane. So a little two chloral, three methyl pentane action happening right there, yes? And it's all about location of where everything is. It's pretty much what names are. It's basically telling people exactly where you can find everything. Again, the couple of things, dash between number and letter, dash between letter and number, dash between number and letter, nothing going on there between letter and letter. Just gonna write it together. Any questions on that one? Yeah. Uh, well, okay, not knowing, but just clarify something from that. Yeah. Three, yeah. So, so the first thing you want to determine is uh, you want to determine which way you want to number the longest carbon chain. So we have the two ways, right? We have the kind of the blue way and the black way. Now, the what determines which way you should number is just as simple as where the groups are located going in each of those directions. So going in the blue direction, we had groups at the same groups, by the way, the same two things. If we numbered it to the blue direction, on the blue direction, those two groups are at carbons two and three. When we numbered it in the right to left or black direction that we were doing, those two groups ended up at carbons three and four. And because they ended up at a higher number in the sort of right to left direction, we don't want to use that numbering at all. So we throw it out. And we want to always go with this, whichever numbering gives the groups the smaller number when we number it. Yes, because these are, these are groups that are branches off of the main chain, right? And basically what this says is two chloral, right there at carbon number two is where my chlorine's at. This is three methyl at carbon number three. That is where I find my methyl group. It's basically showing you where each of the groups are located. Yeah. You do, you do give priority with alkanes to the groups that are attached. The groups, it doesn't matter if it's alkyl group or like a chloral group, if that's your question. It's whatever groups are attached, get the priority. The methyl was attached to carbon number four. Do we number it the other way? No, the numbering always has to do with the longest carbon chain, regardless of where the groups are. You just go one through however many, and then one through however many each way. And then you look at to where the groups are attached. So uh, you should uh, you should number them based on whichever way gives it the smaller number, 
when you put it into the name, it should go alphabetical regardless of the numbering. And that's how you should do it. Yeah. So if, 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 if your question is, regardless of which way you number, they both end up at the same numbers, right? You get the same set of numbers, like two and yeah. four, right? Then what you would do is you would go to the priority of alphabetical first. And whichever one alphabetically has a lower number, that would be probably the right way to do it. The chloral would, would take the priority in that situation if you ended up with two of the same groups of numbers. Because you would want to go whichever way would give the chlorine the lower number because you're going to put it in the name alphabetically first. So you would want to, if you have that option, give it the lower number. 